Hi, welcome back. Um, so this is the second video uh, for Law and Ethics in week one. Um, let me just put myself back down in the corner. So that's what we've done so far in the in the first video. If you haven't seen that, stop this one, go back and watch the first video for week one. Um, so in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, the law in terms of basic principles, sources of law, and then different types of criminal and civil law. So let's get going. Um, so the law. Let's have a think about the basic principles. So uh, that's the, uh, um, the top of the old Bailey down in London. Um, uh, what a justice there with the sword of justice and the scales of justice uh, in, uh, in each hand. Um, so those um, scales of justice are the way, a really useful way of thinking about um, uh, the law and what it uh, involves, because it is a balance. It's a balance between some um, conflicting interests, uh, and we need to be able to balance, make that balance ourselves. So on one side, we have the notion of open justice, that justice um, has to be done in an open um, uh, way. You need to be able to see that justice is done. So that's a really important uh, principle. And that is balanced against um, two other things. Um, the presumption of innocence. So if someone is accused of something, we don't assume that they're guilty, we assume that they're innocent. And also another thing, a right to a fair trial. So you can see these two things are in opposition. So open justice is what journalists rely on to be able to go and tell stories. But we can't just tell every story and put every piece of information out there um, at any time that we want because we have to balance that against a presumption of innocence so we can't just go out and say that someone's um, guilty if they've not been found guilty yet and also we have to uh, respect the right to a fair trial so there are rules around this so there are rules which uh, protect uh, the notions of open justice i.e which protect the rights of people like journalists to go into courts and to be able to report what's going on and to be able to uh, report uh, and to, um, to uh, exercise freedom of speech. But that is all constrained by the other side of the scale, which is a presumption of innocence. I, we presume people are innocent. Uh, we don't presume they're guilty until they're found guilty. Once they've been found guilty by a court, that's fine. We can say they're guilty. And also the right to a fair trial. So remember on our desert island, we talked about how are we going to make sure that people aren't just uh, um, victims of rumour and gossip, they have to have a fair trial in order to um, establish whether they're guilty or innocent. So remember these, these basic principles. If you get lost in um, aspects of law, come back to these. Think about what is it the, that the law is trying to do, and it's trying to balance these, these different things on these scales. So this is a really useful kind of um, way of just finding your bearings within the law. The law is always about these basic principles. So let's have a think about uh, where the law comes from. Well, a number of places. So statute, so those are laws which are passed by um, uh, by parliament. We have uh, common law, and we'll talk about the source of that shortly. Case law, again, we'll talk about that in a moment. And we have Europe for now. Um, but there, even now, now that uh, Brexit has gone ahead and we've left the European Union, there are still uh, um, European sources of law. So statute, um, many of you will have uh, studied this at, uh, previously, but acts of um, parliament. So laws passed by parliament, that's what MPs are doing all the time, is passing laws. Um, they can also pass what they call statutory instruments, which are a, um, uh, a power which the government uh, has to pass laws or pass rules rather than laws. But the key thing is acts of parliament known as statute, so the laws come from there. The next thing is common law. So it's uh, uh, an odd um, uh, set of laws quite often, but they're laws which have come down to us through the ages, um, uh, which are not uh, uh, passed by parliament, uh, but they've come to us just through custom and practice, through, uh, from quite often from a medieval era. So which means there's quite a few archaic laws which we don't actually use anymore but they've come down for various reasons through the ages and you can see there's some quite odd ones uh, so the fact that it's illegal to die in the houses of parliament bizarrely um, and um, uh, you're not allowed to enter the houses of parliament in a suit of armour um, uh, in Scotland it's the law that if someone asks you to use your toilet you must let them enter so there's lots of things obviously uh, laws which um, 
uh, we don't actually use anymore because they were, they were set up uh, in past times, but they are actually still law of the land. Interestingly, there are some um, much more important laws which are common law. So for instance, the fact that it's illegal to murder somebody, you're not allowed to kill someone intending to kill somebody, we all know that, but that's not a law that was passed by Parliament, that's a common law, that's come down to in the ages, and so murder is um, a crime under common law. So whilst there are some funny uh, trivial examples, there are some very significant examples of common law and how it affects our lives. Case law or precedent is another source of law. So what this um, says is that if um, a judge makes a decision um, in one case, then the uh, the reasons that they've used to come to that decision are used are applied to all other cases uh, by um, courts or judges at the same level or below uh, that judge. We'll look at courts in a moment. You'll see there's a hierarchy of um, of courts. So basically, if one judge decides something, then all other judges have to obey it. And of course, again, that's common sense. So that, uh, that the, the same principles and standards are applied across all cases. So if I'm uh, facing a trial for some, something and you're facing a trial for something in different courts, the same standards would be applied. And when you see lawyers and they have all of those books on the shelves, quite often those are those books listing decisions, the sorts of precedents that have been set by previous judges and previous cases. So the law um, quite often will rely on precedent to work out how it should proceed. So um, you can, uh, if a decision is made by a lower court, it can be challenged by a higher court, but it doesn't work the other, oops, that doesn't work the other way around. Uh, a higher court, and we'll talk about those uh, things like Court of Appeal, and Crown Courts, they their decisions are binding on lower courts. So this is this principle that there's a hierarchy of courts, there's lower courts and higher courts. A decision by a higher court binds everything that's um, decided at, by lower courts. So that's a, uh, that's a source of law, so case law, um, uh, sets the standard for um, all other cases of a similar type. And I mentioned Europe, a really important um, uh, source of uh, law is the European Convention on Human Rights. So um, we've uh, now left the influence of the European Court of Justice, uh, all this, uh, those kind of um, jokes that used to be made about straight bananas and stuff uh, being set by the European Court of Justice. So we've now left the, um, that um, uh, through Brexit, but the European Conven Convention on Human Rights, which is um, a really important piece of legislation, uh, administered by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, we're still uh, subject to that and it's actually enshrined in our law. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, there's, a, there's been a change, but we are still under the influence of a European Convention, of the European Convention on Human Rights. So be aware of that. Very briefly about the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, a couple of very important articles, they're called articles within a convention. So Article 6 talks about the right to a fair trial. So we, we said that uh, um, that's an important thing for us uh, on our desert island, that we have sort of rules to protect justice. Well, European Convention on Human Rights enshrines that in Article 6. Article 8, um, a right to privacy. Again, that's an area of law which is really important to us as journalists. And Article 10 talks about the freedom of expression. It protects our right to be journalists and say what we want within certain um, constraints. Remember those uh, that um, uh, those scales of justice. We we are free of expression, but as long as we respect people's um, right to a fair trial and their presumption of innocence. So, European Convention on Human Rights has these key articles within it, which uh, affect what we do as journalists. So that's really a really important source. European Convention of Human Rights was actually enshrined in, in British law, in UK law, by the Human Rights Act 1998. So it's part of British law, um, uh, those basic principles. So things like right to a fair trial, freedom of expression and privacy are enshrined in British law. Um, there are certain um, uh, exemptions, but we don't need to worry about those just yet. When you do the reading associated with the week this week, you'll see some of the detail on that. And the reason that uh, it's important, you can see it um, uh, actually coming uh, to bear on what we do as, as journalists. So the um, 
the European Convention of, on Human Rights, um, and it, what it said about privacy was the, the source of super injunctions, which became uh, very high, high profile a couple of years ago. Uh, people like Ryan Giggs, former Manchester United player, uh, used super injunctions to stop the press um, uh, publishing information about things that they've been doing, and affair in this particular case. Now, um, that became a, um, a controversy because not only did the super injunction stop uh, us uh, talking about the, the information, it stopped us even reporting uh, that there were a legal proceedings had been going on, stopped even suggesting that there, there was a football player. So basically it really uh, stifled our freedom of expression. There was a lot of uh, rows about it and now super injunctions have, uh, have stepped back a bit. People have stepped back from super injunctions. So we, um, but we do need to fight to maintain our ability to tell stories. So uh, just be aware that the European Convention of Human Rights can be used uh, as a very powerful tool uh, to uh, affect what we do as, uh, as journalists. So moving on, two basic divisions of law. Um, so have a think about this. Um, there's the criminal law and there's the civil law two very distinct types of law, different standards of evidence, different courts involved, um, and different uh, areas of uh, activity. So let's um, have a look what these two involve. Um, so, it's right here, the criminal law. First thing I want to talk about is the criminal law. So let's have a look at that. So within the criminal law, um, these are offences that harm the whole community. So the uh, things like murder and um, uh, sexual offences, uh, theft, all of those sorts of um, uh, offences are offences that harm the whole community. And because they serve the whole, they harm the whole community, they're regarded as being crimes against the sovereign, against the queen. If you murder someone, it's, it's regarded as a crime against the queen, um, which means that when the, uh, uh, the case is listed in a court, you'll see that it's the it's listed as R, which stands for Regina, if it's as a queen, or Rex if it's a king. So at the moment we have a queen. So R versus Joe Blocks, R versus Ian Wood. Uh, so it's the queen versus uh, Ian Wood if it's a criminal, uh, if it's a, a criminal case, i.e. Uh, an offence which is regarded as um, harming the whole community. Key thing about criminal law is that the burden of proof is very high. It has to be uh, proved beyond reasonable doubt. So it's a very high burden of proof. Uh, you have to convince um, uh, the court, generally a jury, that, um, uh, that the person did this and it's, it's beyond any reasonable doubt that they are guilty. Um, so um, uh, just be aware of that. So you can tell if it's um, a criminal case by simply by the name of the case because it will be listed as R versus Ian Wood or R versus Joe Bloggs and the burden of proof is, a, is beyond reasonable doubt. So those are important aspects of uh, criminal cases. So civil law, we move on to civil law, a bit different. Um, uh, so the, these are disputes between individuals um, which have to, uh, or, um, or groups uh, where there's an issue uh, which has to be resolved between those two individuals or groups. So it's not a crime against the community as a whole, it's a, uh, uh, an issue, a dispute between two groups. Um, so things like family law, divorce, um, if um, you want to sue somebody because you say they haven't delivered on the, um, uh, on the promises they've made, on the contracts that they've signed. So uh, the burden of proof for a civil case is a um, balance of probability. So that's a lower burden of proof. It's not as high as the uh, beyond reasonable doubt, which we saw in criminal cases. Uh, it's a balance of probabilities. And when you see it on the list, you'll see, because it's um, uh, a dispute between two individuals, you'll see, or two groups, you'll see it listed as that. So if it's uh, a Mr. Smith and a Mrs. Bloggs who are in dispute, you'll see it listed as Smith versus Bloggs. So we don't see R in the, in the name of the case. So we can see that it's a civil case because it's got two, uh, two groups or individuals listed in, in, the, in the name of the case. Um, the, the picture I've gone on there, I forgot to mention with criminal uh, cases, but that's the Civil Justice Centre in Manchester, uh, known as the Filing Cabinet for obvious reasons. 
Um, so when you're walking around Manchester and you spot that building uh, just off Deansgate, um, uh, that's the Civil Justice Centre and that's where civil cases are heard uh, in and around Greater Manchester. If I just go back to that previous slide, oops, um, the, the criminal cases, you'll see that picture down in the bottom right is the Crown Court, Manchester Crown Court. Now Manchester has two Crown Courts. It has Crown Square, which is what this one is, and it also has Minshaw Street, which is a different uh, Crown Court. Um, that they're senior courts. We also have magistrates' courts dotted around, um, certainly in Manchester and around in other parts of Greater Manchester. So uh, different types of court dealing with different types of case. So just be aware of that, um, criminal cases and civil cases. It's possible for some cases to uh, be to involve both uh, areas of law. So we have um, this case. I mentioned it uh, in the first video. Christopher Jeffries. This is the uh, the man who was wrongly accused of murdering one of his um, tenants, a young woman called Joanna Yates. Now um, that case involved contempt. So that I mentioned that newspapers had basically spread rumours and. Uh, uh, reported untrue and unfounded allegations about him, um, which meant that um, the, uh, the courts decided that if he had ever faced a trial, he never did face a trial because he wasn't. He, there was no evidence against him. But if he had ever faced a trial, that the he could not have got a fair trial. So um, that's uh, against the laws of contempt. And so remember those scales. We said that uh, everyone had a right to a fair trial. The, well. The courts decided that he had had his right to a fair trial taken away. So that was a criminal offence uh, which the newspapers had uh, committed. But also um, uh, there was a civil issue because those newspapers had diminished his reputation. They had spread rumours, reported um, information about him which reduced his reputation, which damaged him in some way. And that was known as defamation. So that's a civil case. So that's uh, an issue of him suing the newspapers uh, as a, a dispute between them as two groups. So that was a civil aspect. So we had the, the criminal uh, side of things, contempt, i.e. the system saying there's, a, there's an offence against the community here, that someone's had their right to a fair trial removed. So that was a criminal case and that was looked at uh, through the criminal courts. And then we also had a civil aspect to this story uh, where um, we have Christopher Jeffries saying uh, that a particular newspaper has damaged his reputation and he wants some compensation for that. So that's a civil case. Um, so remember, it's criminal, uh, you have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Civil, uh, you have to um, only prove it uh, on the, um, the balance of probabilities. So just uh, interesting to see cases where it involves both civil and criminal law. Okay, so that's the um, basic principles of law. Really useful if you um, make sure you uh, um, make sure you have a really good understanding, a really good grasp of those basic principles. If you do, everything else gets a bit easier. Now you're going to be learning about uh, different uh, different topics of law, but underlying those individual topics are these basic principles. So key things, um, uh, you need to look at that, that balance between uh, the freedom of uh, expression, the freedom of speech, balancing against the um, right to a fair trial and the presumption of innocence. Make sure you're aware of the difference between criminal and civil law. Um, and um, then also in the next video, we're going to look at the different um, uh, courts that are involved in the system. So I'm going to end this video now. And if you'd like to join me for the third video, uh, we'll talk about uh, the, um, uh, the court system in, um, uh, in the UK.